uh, is on your mind. I am very touched that all of you came in the middle of a Sunday afternoon to, to talk to me, and you should just ask me anything. That's Other on questions? Your mind. You don't have to come sit up, up here like I made. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, what shift do you think has happened um, over the last 20 years or so in, in people having non monogamous uh, arrangements in their relationships? Is that more common, or is it still? I think uh, in terms of the uh, media and cultural conversation, there's much more acknowledgement that uh, everybody ought to be a little bit more real. I mean, the most recent discussion that Dan Savage started about being monogamish <laughs> was very helpful um, because it allowed people who didn't want it to say, hey, look, I'm not a swinger. I'm not going to an orgy next week. It's just that strict monogamy is not the litmus test for my relationship. You know, uh, it, it, is that so hard to wrap one's mind about? It also helped a lot of couples who, for whom they never wanted to break their vows to each other, but in fact they did. And they had a terrible argument and things looked really grim, but they ended up staying together. I think that is, I don't only really think, I know that is so much more common than people getting a finale divorce. Um, there was recently, I think this is a very gendered question, because there was a recent survey, I don't know who this came from, the Goodmacher Institute, or some, some very fancy group, did a survey where they asked a, a large group of men and women, would an act of adultery be curtains for your relationship, for your marriage? And most of the women said, yes, absolutely, of course, you know, that's it, it's over. And a slight majority of men said, no, you know, might not be so great, but I think we'd carry on. I think, I think that those, the results, um, from my own, I think the results were a little deceptive because I think for women to say that you would accept adultery is like saying you are a useless, worthless, or tramp, you know, like you have diminished your feminine virtue to say that you would ever, ever accept such a thing. You were supposed to say no. Even though in real life, um, it's almost certain that your partner over a long period of time will have another partner and you will either not know about it or you will tacitly know about it or you will obviously know about it and you will carry on. Absolutely. And so there's a great deal of lying going on about this, but I think there is more humor and a temperament, and who's the leaders of it? Definitely everyone who's participated in discussions about open marriages, polyamory, ethical slutdom, play party, you know, everybody in our little circle, we were certainly the forward edge of that, you know, questioning, why do you think this is the be all and end all? Um, and certainly, I, I think we in some ways, we had the therapeutical community on our side because anybody who's ever been in couples counseling over this, the therapist will, will often say, you know, this doesn't have to be yeah. the end. Maybe they don't say that on the first time you walk in, in the room, but they know that most couples get through this because there are so many other reasons they're together. Maybe good reasons or bad reasons, but it doesn't always end in a split. Um, I think... The, still, the biggest misunderstanding um, is folks who say, well, I could never be non-monogamous because I'm jealous. I can't help being jealous. I'm like, of course you can't. We're animals. Welcome to jealousy. Everyone's jealous. The notion that you have to be some strange, saintly, emotionless person is absurd. Everyone who is actively pursuing an open lifestyle sexually uh, uh, works with their jealous feelings. And what's so interesting when people say, well, how has it been for you, Susie? Because just by a feature of my generation, I've never been in a monogamous relationship. It was really not cool when I was a teenager. It was considered very bourgeois to go <laughs> steady with someone. And you wouldn't be caught dead saying that you would do something like that. We were all like, hippies and revolutionaries and oh my god you know I am not anybody's property so I started out that way and it just never stopped the early queer community was the same and so on and so on so I've never pledged that kind of 
promise. It just seems like bizarre to me, quaint. And yet, after all this period of time, have my feelings been hurt? Of course. Have I hurt, you know, my primary partner's feelings? Absolutely. But I also have endless, you know, ones where I said, that was really sweet. That worked out just fine. Or, you know, it was just one of those things, you know, came and went, no big deal. I mean, there's every level, you know, and the more you experience it, the more you realize it's as individual as any kind of friendships. I often talk to people about this, like, do you have any friends outside of your marriage? Well, have you noticed that some friends are like part of the family and everybody loves them and other ones, you know, your spouse hates them and you always just have to go off and have your movie alone together. I mean, it's every possible thing. It's just, it is another kind of friendship. It's another kind of intimacy. And um, I'm glad you brought that up because see, that's another little ray of sunshine. I think we have moved forward on that count. Other questions? Please. Um, you mentioned you're no longer compelled to make the midnight run to Esalen. Uh, <laughs> it's, I gather it's an age thing. Well, I'm, we're roughly contemporaries, I figure, and uh, my children are grown now, and I do feel compelled to, to engage <laughs> in ways like that. And at the same time, I don't want to be the stereotypical old guy at the you know. Oh. So uh, I'm asking for some insight here. Like, where do you kind of draw the line? When do you start to contract uh, from, you know, uh, the world at large? Oh, I wish my my um, partner was here to hear you say this, because he'd say this exact same thing as you. I mean, if I called him up right now and I said, I just met these really hot people today, you know, at this shindig up here, they all want to go to Esalen tonight and take acid and Fuck. He'd be like, oh my god, it's been so long since you said this. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> and, and I'd be like, well, you know, maybe if I have a cup of coffee. I'm not going to take a fucking drip. I, you know, I'd be like, can't we just come over to our house? And, you know, and I'm going to need a nap. I mean, I am like such a, an idiot about this. Where I, I am, this is interesting when people talk about your libido waning, um, it really is like a lack of, of physical compulsion and impulsivity, you know, like when, and you can talk to people about this, it doesn't even have to do with age, like people who are on antidepressants, you know, who say their libido is shadowed. It's like, you just feel like you can take it or leave it. You honestly feel like you could leave it. And, um, and if you were in a different place, you would feel, oh, no, I have to jump on that. I absolutely have. I cannot say no. You know, I must follow it. And um, I think that that's why I say that my masturbation life is a real interesting indicator to me, like, because I only do that if I feel like it, right? So it's sort of like, hmm, I'm, you know, I want this. Um, but it's also easy and it's completely on my terms. And with the, um, I think with, when I meet guys of, of your age, and see, I thought you were far younger than me, but when I, look, you, you, you have a notion of yourself as appearing as an older man. It's not, I don't think to myself, oh my God, that crazy old horn dog, who let him in? I never feel that way. It's, I much more have a reaction. I see the younger women too, in how, how they hang out, how they are. I mean, who gets sick of compliments? I like being desired and wanted, you know? You don't like someone being obnoxious, but who doesn't like uh, to be flattered, really? I think you're never gonna lose with being flattered, you're never gonna lose with um, being charmed with, with showing a little bit of your sexual self. Yes, of course, one continues to deal with rejection, but I mean, this is one of my favorite things about being a dyke as long as I did, was to become accustomed to what is normally thought of as a masculine experience, which is getting rejected by women. You know, mm -hmm. it can be capricious and relentless. Uh, and <laughs> I remember one time, I wanted to write this article for Esquire that said, it's going to be called What Dykes and Straight Men Have in Common, and it's all about women rejecting you, and how it really sucks, <laughs> and how it's always on their terms. You know, the one who wants has to get accepted. 
Uh, but uh, all you can do is just hang in there and, uh, it, and go back to the volume, you know? Uh, it, you will find people who say, yeah, I think you're hot, and I'm glad you, you came to the hot tub. Thank God you're here. Let's do it. You know, and <laughs> that sort of, you know, good hope and cheer has sort of got to hold a little bit of magic. Mm -hmm.